Welcome to this course on Project and Technology Management in Laboratory Automation. The purpose of this course is to help you understand the unique aspects of project management when it is applied to laboratory work. During this course, we are going to be looking at what project management is, what the goals of using project management are, how project management, when applied to laboratory automation projects, differs from project management when used in other programs and projects, and finally, we'll look at the methods and techniques that are available to assist you in this work. This course adds to the basics of project management. It will stress the application of project management techniques to lab projects. The basic concepts of project management, while necessary, isn't enough to be successful in lab applications. The material in this course will provide the specific elements needed to meet the challenges of laboratory work. Additional study of project management basics is encouraged to provide a thorough background. You might wonder why you should consider using project management techniques in your programs. The items that will show up on the screen will give you an idea why this is important. In most laboratory situations, regulatory issues are important, whether they stem from the FDA, EPA, or ISO requirements. A well-designed project management program will help demonstrate the integrity of the project and meet regulatory requirements, including those of systems validation. The next three bullets will be taken together because they cover the same issues from different perspectives. Laboratory projects have lifetimes, and over the course of the life of a project, updates will be done, and a number of different people may be involved. A well-documented project management program will provide a corporate memory for why and how things were done, so that successive individuals will have a basis to build on. Successful projects will be reused over a long period of time and may be used in different laboratories. By having solid documentation, it will be a lot easier to transfer the work that was done from one lab to another. This reduces costs, improves the quality of projects, and on a personal level, shows that you're someone who knows what they're doing. One of the trends in laboratory work today, and in a lot of corporate work, is outsourcing all or parts of projects. This involves not only understanding what's being done within your group, but also communicating with the outsourced party. If you're going to be successful, the project has to be well managed and well documented. In both testing and research laboratories, there is a need to be able to defend the data that's being generated in case there's a challenge either in court or in support of patent issues. One line of attack is to challenge the way the work was done. By having a solid, well-documented project management program, you can demonstrate that the underlying projects used to create the data were properly managed and meet all regulatory requirements. The references on the screen show different perspectives on what project management is all about and how to go about it. These are all good references and will help you understand what has to be done successfully using these methodologies. But there is one problem. Most courses on project management are designed for general purpose use. It might be used for anything from shipbuilding to construction to financial projects. They pretty much treat everything as being the same type of project. While most of what is covered in these courses will be of use to you, they will omit some key factors that apply to laboratory work. This is a common definition of what project management is all about. It says that project management is a carefully planned and organized effort to accomplish a specific one-time objective. That includes developing project plans, identifying tasks and goals, the resources needed, and determining budgets and timelines for completion of the project. The problem comes in with a text that is highlighted in yellow. Projects in laboratories are not one-time projects. The systems that will be developed will be modified, upgraded, and re-engineered over time. At each of these stages, they will have to meet the requirements of regulatory bodies. This is a significant departure from typical project management work. 
The major part of this course will be talking about how to address these concerns. For our purposes, project management is a process for getting something accomplished. In order to be successful, you have to be good at process management and working with people. That includes the points that are shown on the screen and covers defining the project and determining its feasibility. In laboratory work, that can be a fairly complex item since it will involve the ability to work with a number of systems that were designed to work independently of each other. It also means that you will be involved with prototyping systems to demonstrate the feasibility of the final project. Justification. Being able to explain clearly what the purpose of the project is, what the benefits are, and in most cases what the return on investment is going to be. This last point can be hard to quantify since lab work is often done as a cost center and not as a profit center. So return on investment may be linked to things such as improved performance, faster sample turnaround, cost reductions, and improvements in the ability to carry out research projects. These are things that are not easy to describe in terms of dollars and cents, but rather addressed as improvements in operations. There are cases where the argument may be as simple as, if we're going to meet the testing needs of either manufacturing or research, we need these systems, or the research project cannot move forward until this work is done. Beyond that, the process involves planning, the development stage, and finally installation and acceptance before the results of the project can be put into daily use. One word that's missing from that outline is validation. Almost every laboratory project will require validation. That is, documented proof that the system works properly and does what it was designed to do. We'll cover this later in the course, but basically the entire project management process sums up what validation is all about. A well-designed, well-documented, and properly implemented project management process almost automatically results in a validated system. Although this chart is based on a survey that was done in 2008, before economics became interesting, the general trend still holds true. Automation is going to become an increasingly important component of laboratory work. In addition, automation is becoming increasingly complex. Vendors are producing point solutions to complex problems. No single vendor is going to provide you with a system that meets all your requirements for all the types of equipment and problems that need to be addressed. As a result, you're going to have to take on the role of making sure these things work and work together. An earlier survey reported in 2007 took a look at who's going to be doing support for laboratory systems. Almost half are going to be using contracts with external resources. This means that the person you're coming in contact with may change, and relying on one individual's memory on how things are supposed to work isn't going to be a successful approach. The same holds true for any of the support resources. There is no guarantee that the same people will be available to work with you on a long-term basis. As a result, a well-documented system is going to be necessary to provide the references you need to keep track of what is happening to the system and how they've been developed and modified and support requirements necessary to maintain them. These should be considered as living documents and should be prepared and managed in a way that provides easy access and management. Electronics-based approaches are better than printed material. The two questions on the screen are key. The people responsible for implementation support are going to change over time, and they will need material to base their work upon. If you are the original project manager and leave them with a solid basis for doing their work, you will look better and gain a reputation for doing good work. If you are the developer, the documentation that is created is your contract with the client. It should provide a complete description of what they expect, what you've agreed to, what the schedules and cost estimates are, what will be delivered in the level of support that you expect to provide, and finally, what the acceptance criteria are. While this may seem like a lot of documentation at the beginning of the project, it can save your neck at the end. The last thing you want to do is have a discussion along the lines of, but I thought you said it would do this. Having a signed objective reference to what has been agreed on is worth its weight in gold. If you are the end user, the same documentation protects you as well, 
by providing you with a clear understanding of what you've mutually agreed to and what the delivery dates and final costs are expected to be. This documentation needs to be thorough enough so that any questions about what was expected can be readily cleared up. If all or part of the project has been outsourced, the documentation should address some additional significant points. Having a clear understanding of the ownership of the project and the results of the work is essential. Often, an outside consulting company will take on a project with the idea that the results may be turned into a product that they can sell in the open market. You should have a clear understanding whether or not you have the same perspective. Do you want something that you put a lot of effort into, potentially being provided to a competitor? There should be a clear statements about copyrights and confidentiality agreements. This should also cover publication rights. The outsourced company may want to refer to this work to bolster their position with future clients. Do you want something that you consider as being confidential, showing up in a magazine article or a conference proceeding? There should also be provision for thorough support documentation. Basically, you have to assume that the vendor may go away at the end of the project. While the company may be in business, the key personnel that worked on your project may not be available for support. You need to have enough documentation so that the project can be turned over to other individuals and have them pick it up with minimal effort. One thing you should be aware of is that support documentation is one thing that developers dislike doing. So your expectations for the quality and the content of the document need to be clearly spelled out. The documentation created is an objective memory of what is going on. If it isn't in the documentation, it didn't happen, since there's no record of discussions or agreements. This is key because people change in the course of a project, particularly one that may extend over months or years. Thorough documentation is the antidote for meetings. If you don't like meetings, make sure the documentation is clear and up to date. This can help avoid confusion over what is expected, what has been agreed to, and what responsibilities fall to each of the parties working on the project. A successful project implementation results in the system that meets the user's needs, including regulatory concerns. It is supportable and can be gracefully upgraded as needed. By gracefully upgraded, we mean that changes can be made without basically starting over from scratch. That the implementation is done, well engineered and well documented, so that someone who is new to the project can be pick it up and modify it, extend it, upgrade it, or if needed, replace portions of it with new equipment. All of these are likely events. It should also meet all regulatory requirements, including validation. The system should be validated even if no regulatory requirements exist. Remember that validation is documented proof that the system works. You want to have that before you accept the project as being delivered. The previous sections have looked at what project management is and its goals and how they relate to the work you're doing. Now we want to branch off from traditional project management and start looking at things that go on in laboratories that invite additional requirements to the work. Where traditional project management is concerned with one-time projects, the lab world has to deal with other considerations. We've mentioned things such as provision for revisions and updates, but in addition to those, we have to be concerned about things such as upgrades to hardware and software components, product life cycles, and systems maintenance. Since most automation projects deal with software, we can expect updates and changes in hardware requirements as products and operating systems evolve. One of the most vexing issues in dealing with laboratory software is that software upgrades that may only have a minimal impact on office products can cripple laboratory software systems. This is an area that has to be addressed with IT support since many IT organizations require all systems to be running the latest operating system. The thing that's key is not the operating system, but the application that supports your work. Your ability to function in the lab depends upon the application software working, not the operating system. You also have to do, deal with the fact that in more complex software systems, for example those that work with a database, the operating system application and database may all be updated at different points. Another consideration is product life cycles. Vendors will discontinue products, create new families of products, and your projects will have to deal with those changes. Documentation that explains why certain products were selected and any critical features will be very useful in upgrading and making changes to the existing systems. 
Another consideration is that lab automation is process-oriented, not object-oriented. That means we're not trying to build an object such as a bridge or a ship, but trying to develop a system that implements the process. That means the ability to understand and analyze the process is essential. And as we've mentioned many times, there's a need to meet regulatory requirements. We'll spend more time on outsourcing later, but we just wanted to note that in laboratory work, outsourcing issues can include three types of activities. The first is method development, where a company is being hired to develop test procedures to be used in your laboratories. Second, systems development, where consultants or consulting companies are being used to develop automation systems to meet your requirements. Or, finally, where testing is being outsourced, because either the nature of testing is something that can't be handled in-house, or the volume of testing exceeds the lab's capabilities to handle it. For many people, laboratory automation and computing is product-oriented, consisting of the types of things that you see on the screen that include things such as high-throughput screening, laboratory information management systems, electronic laboratory notebooks, robotics, liquid handling systems, and so on. That's not the approach we take to laboratory automation and computing. If we really want to understand laboratory automation, we need to take a step back and look at it from a much broader viewpoint. Within the work we're doing, laboratory automation is all about processes and process management. Frank Zini, who headed up Zymark, a laboratory robotics company, would introduce his courses with a statement that you don't automate a device, you automate a process. The statement on the screen reflects the Institute's definition of laboratory automation, and I'll read it just for emphasis. Laboratory automation is the process of determining needs and requirements, planning projects and programs, evaluating products and technologies, developing and implementing those projects according to a set of methodologies that results in a successful systems that meet your goals. We believe that definitions are important because some definitions can cause you to have too narrow a view of what laboratory automation is about. We believe a broader definition is important to enable you to see the full scope of what's involved and what's possible. Laboratory automation is not about science. It's about the way science is done. It's about the way the work is accomplished. Science provides the process. Laboratory automation is one means of process implementation. In addition, it's not about products, but it is about how products are used in that process implementation. What that does is to add more detail to products and technology management and planning. If your project includes a complete process, the steps in the process have to be clearly understood, documented, and certified as an accurate description. That last point is critical for two reasons. First, if the documentation is not accurate, all of your work may result in a nice product, but one based on the wrong description. Second, don't trust the documentation that's handed to you. Don't take it at face value. Too often, the printed description of the process is simply the last update, and may not reflect formal or informal changes to the process. Frequently, people will make adjustments to a procedure that are critical to a success, and not write them down. The best approach when looking at laboratory processes is to study the written documentation and then follow someone around who is actually doing that work. Take careful notes and compare what they're doing to what's written. If possible, learn to carry out the process yourself. You may learn things that are essential to success that may not be clear from the written documentation. There's a book out titled In the Age of the Smart Machine, in which the author describes the automation of paper mills in Maine. The people who authorized the project to automate the facility gave the consulting company the detailed written procedures used to operate the plant. The project failed. The reason for the failure is that plant personnel had their own tweaks and adjustments to the plant's operating rules that were never documented. These proved to be the breaking points for the automation program. If your project only concerns part of the process, you need to have the same information, but really pay attention to the details of the portion of the process you are dealing with and how it connects to the rest of the process and the steps both preceding 
and following the section you're responsible for. Again, follow people doing the process. Make sure you understand the entire process and how the section you're going to be working on fits in and any special considerations that need to be taken into account to make sure you're successful. Talk to people that are doing the work and get their input. They may have some information that will spell the difference between your success and a project failure. When you're ready to install your change to the process, you should first make sure the process is working without the change, just to be sure you are working with the same baseline you expected. Then, insert the work you've done and demonstrate that the process is functioning properly. You should also check to make sure there's been no changes to the process during the course of your work's development. As long as we're discussing processes, one question you should look at is whether or not the process description you're working with is the best process for the given task. This is not a question of the science, but it is more a matter of the suitability of the process for automation. Can the process be automated? Or will changes have to be made to make automation possible? Will those changes adversely affect the science? To illustrate the point, consider toothpicks. How would you go about making one toothpick? The most common responses are to take a piece of wood and start whittling until you're down to a toothpick. That's an expensive process, and yet it's similar to the processes that are developed for laboratory work. They are designed for samples to be processed manually, often one at a time, without concern for process efficiency. Now consider how you'd make millions of toothpicks so that 800 of them would sell for about 59 cents. Now cost and efficiency are part of the problem and require a drastic change in how the process is carried out. The same kind of thinking is necessary when you analyze a process that is given to you for laboratory work. The process that has been designed and intended to be carried out by lab personnel may not be effective or efficient when automation is being considered. When automation is being used, the nature of the processes may change drastically. There may be equipment changes, process changes, and all of these have to be factored in when determining the feasibility of the project and the return on investment. They also have to be tested against the science to make sure that something hasn't changed that will affect the results and the validity of the work. If the work you are doing is only going to change part of the process, you need to evaluate what impact it will have on the rest of the system. This is part of the feasibility portion of project planning. If you increase the performance of the system, will that just shift the bottleneck downstream? What assumptions does the system depend upon, and will the changes you make violate some of those assumptions? Will product or product version changes impact programming elsewhere in the system? For example, if you have communications between one product and another, will doing an upgrade to one of those products disrupt that communications? Suppose the purpose of your project is to improve the throughput of step two. Perhaps it is viewed as a bottleneck in the system flow. If you increase the throughput of that step, will the next step in this system be able to take advantage of it, or will you have just moved the problem to another stage? If step two involves a reagent addition, is there a backup between step two and step three that will change the processing conditions and the results? For example, is there an aging issue, or will it result in prolonged reaction times and change the process and results that it uh, produces? In some cases, duplicating systems may make more sense than upgrading a system to get higher throughput. Consider that you already have a working system, and all you have to do is make another one, and in effect doubling the throughput. This doesn't require any additional design or development, although you still have to validate it to ensure it's been installed properly. In addition, you now have a backup system in case one of the systems goes down. Yes, there would be a reduction in throughput, but it won't go to zero. These are considerations that have to be reviewed as part of project feasibility work. Another point that needs to be considered in planning projects is that of product life cycles. The diagram on the screen shows a very simple idea of a life cycle, which for the most part is consistent with most people's expectations. The vendor determines product requirements. Based on those product requirements, it goes into development. It's released to the customer base, and depending upon what the customer's reaction is, plans are laid for upgrades and revisions, and from there on, the cycle continues. It's a simple diagram with a simple concept and totally useless. 
This diagram is one that has been developed by the Institute to better understand product life cycles and their impact on your work. Just as in the previous diagram, we begin with an initial product concept that goes to development, testing, and the beginning of the marketing program, and then the product is released to customers. At this point, we take into consideration how the market receives the product. If the product is successful, it continues and based on customer input, competitive products, and the availability of new technologies, plans are laid for upgrades. At this juncture, the vendor has to determine whether or not those changes are feasible with the existing product, or if the requirements are different enough that a new product generation has to be developed. If those changes are within the scope of what can be done with the existing product, it goes into the same upgrade requirements and development process, and then back into the customer's hands. This has a relatively minor impact on the customer. As long as the changes that are made do not disrupt the customer's operation, the impact is simply the effort involved in upgrading, validating, and putting the product into use. If the changes necessary are not feasible with the existing product, then a decision has to be made about developing a new product generation. If that is feasible, and move to the top of the diagram, we look at product concepts and work our way down to the rest of the process. This has a relatively moderate impact on customers because we're not talking about just upgrades but potentially changing software that has been developed for the previous generation products. This can have some disruption on your lab's operations. If the product fails or a new generation of products is not justified, the product is retired. This can have a significant impact on your laboratory because things such as product support are called into question, as is the availability of spare parts and your laboratory's ability to continue working with the equipment it has on hand. Once this stage is reached, your lab has to consider what step it's going to take to move forward and replace the product and determine how quickly this has to be done. Depending on the st current state of the product, you may be able to live with it for several years. When evaluating products for use in projects, you have to consider where the product is in its life cycle and what the vendor's likely response is going to be to future developments. If it is at the end of its life cycle, you may want to avoid it. If it's in its early stages of development, you may want to wait a little bit to see if the product is successful in the marketplace, assuming you have time to do that. The sweet spot is a product that is in at least its second revision. At that point, you know the product has some market acceptance, and you're better able to gauge the vendor's response to future developments. If possible, avoid a dependence on specific versions of products, so in case changes are made, their impact will be less severe. The product life cycle issue can impact your ability to work with laboratory data. This diagram shows a very simple process for working with samples in a lab. The basic steps are the sample preparation, processing, and then data acquisition, analysis, and reporting being done by a software package. This is pretty much the common structure for instrument data systems. Those data systems are built upon software applications which in turn sit on top of an operating system then it turns it's on top of hardware. One thing that often isn't realized is that when you buy a piece of software, you don't own the software, you license it. That puts some restrictions on your ability to work with it. In most cases, the database generated by the laboratory systems require the application to understand it. In some cases, the vendor may provide the ability to export the data into a simple database or file structure but may often omit important relationships in programming. What this means is that your ability to use data either in your own lab's operations or to support patents or challenges concerning data quality depends on a piece of software that you have little control over. It's important that you understand what the vendor's plans are for the software, how they plan to support it, and what they might do if the product is taken off the market. For example, if the company goes out of business, can you get access to the software's code so that you can provide support if needed? Since the software and data are intimately connected, you may need the software to work with the data files. One of the technologies that's growing in popularity in information technology circles is that of virtualization. Virtualization allows you to move software from desktop systems to servers where it's easy to maintain and gain access to. For some applications, those, for example, that do not require real-time data acquisition, this can be a very useful technique for improving access, performance, support, 
and ease of maintenance. However, doing this could violate the license agreement you have for the software license. Some vendors will permit their use of their software in virtualized environments, others may not, or they may ask for an additional license fee. The time to address these issues is before you purchase the software. At this point, the vendor may be willing to make concessions to allow you to work in the environment you prefer. You also need to consider that in this simple diagram, there are three layers, and each layer has its own product lifecycle. The operating system versions may change, and the application software may lag behind in its support for an upgraded OS. If the company providing the software is small, they may not be able to keep up with operating system changes. If your IT group requires that all systems have the latest operating systems, you may need to put in for a waiver for the laboratories since changes in operating systems may cause problems with products. Another consideration is how long you need to have access to the data that these applications hold. In many cases, it may be decades. How many product generations will that cover? During the course of these product generations, data file formats may change, algorithms may change, and your ability to work with older data may be compromised. If you have the data but lose access to the processing routines that generated it, will the data still stand up to a challenge? This is one of the reasons why virtualization is important. You can capture multiple generations of software, each with its own data sets, and have continued access as product generations change. This is very important in your planning process, and these need to be addressed at the beginning of the project rather than at its conclusion. Your project plans may need to carry statements about where there are dependencies on specific versions of products and what plans need to be made for product transitions. Essentially, this will act as a guide for the next person to pick up the project if they have to do upgrades or modifications. And keep in mind that next person may still be you. One major component of the development of laboratory systems is that of validation. Without it, no project is complete. The purpose of validation is to develop a level of confidence in the systems that you're using for any purpose. Those systems may be instruments, automation systems, computer software, or anything that is used in the laboratory. When you're looking at validating systems, there is a hierarchical approach to dealing with systems evaluation and analysis. You want to make sure that at each level, things work the way they're supposed to. In some cases, it may mean that the operation of one component depends upon the operation of a second. If the second component isn't working properly, then anything that relies on it will be basing its results on faulty data. The whole point of validation procedures is to go through the operations under review, make sure all components are designed properly for the purposes intended, that they work properly, and that they can properly be maintained over long periods of time. Again, the bottom line is simple. We want to build confidence in the systems that are being used to generate laboratory data. In traditional validation programs, there are two approaches to validation, retrospective and prospective validation. At a certain point, let's say today, we separate the use of these two approaches. Any system that have not been validated would be using retrospective methods. Basically going over the system in question, making sure the documentation is in place, checking any areas where there might be a question or additional work is needed, and providing documented evidence that the system has been working according to its design criteria. All other programs would be evaluated according to prospective methods that will be described in the following slides. One question that often comes up in project development is this. Why go through the trouble of validating something if you don't know the approach you're taking will work? It's a good question because frequently in development projects, there are blind alleys and places where changes in direction take place. It isn't uncommon for people to build the system and then retrospectively validate it. One of the problems with this approach is that you may not have the best system possible, and you may have taken some shortcuts in the development process, for example using materials that are at hand instead of going off and evaluating specifications and vendors the way it needs to be done in a properly validated project. What those systems do yield is a good prototype. It may be a working system, but during the course of development, there are often places that come up where we might say, if we had to do this again, we'd do it better, or 
we use another approach that would yield better results. Prototypes are a good place to start and give you a lot of worthwhile information to use as a basis for building a system for long-term use. Realistically, in a very short-term project, the prototype may be good enough. But if a project is going to go on for a lengthy period of time and will be expected to produce data that is going to be used in critical applications, such as patents or drug approval, the job needs to be done right. What you learn from prototypes are where changes need to be made, the details of the product specifications needed for components, and evaluation of the user's reaction to what you're producing, which may result in changes to the product requirements or its design. The bottom line is that we'll have a better project and a better product. The illustration on the screen represents something called the GAMP V. The V is taken from the shape of the diagram. This shows a process of developing software for an automated system. The same logic can be used for any automation project since most involve software development. Note that if you want to learn more about good automated manufacturing practices, or GAMP, one place to look is the International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineers. On the left side of the diagram, you see the development of specifications for the project. On the bottom, the actual development project, and on the right, a series of tests that demonstrate that the system produced meets the user's requirements. The project begins with the development of user requirements specifications by the customer. The response, which is the responsibility of both the customer and supplier, which might be an internal group, consists of an overall functional specification and the hardware and software design requirements. In each case, these have to be jointly approved by both the customer and supplier. With the specifications in place, the supplier then begins to develop the system beginning with the development of the specifications for each element of the software system, developing and reviewing the code, and then testing it to ensure that it's working properly. As we move up the stages on the right-hand side of the diagram, at each step, we test the elements produced against the specification. Software is tested against software design specifications, as is the hardware and software combined, and then we go through the system's acceptance testing, and finally a performance qualification. The last point is a final test of the system by the customer against the initial user requirement specification. If we look at the GAMP V, what we see is the outline of a good engineering project. We see expected elements such as project requirements documents, functional specifications, and design documents. That's followed by the development process. And finally, the testing and proof that the system works and does what it was expected to do. The validation project outline produced in the good automated manufacturing practices exactly reflects a well-designed and implemented engineering program. In short, a solid project management and engineering program will lead to a validated system. The validation lifecycle plan, as described in GAMP, is essentially the same as standard software development life cycles. One of the criticisms of the GAMP approach is that it's a poor product life cycle diagram. It was never designed to be one. It is a design for project development program and does not include functions for maintenance, upgrades, or other considerations. The diagram on the right shows a product life cycle diagram that was used and developed by the Institute and discussed a few minutes ago. Recognize that portions of the GAMP diagram fit within this larger product life cycle illustration and address the concerns about the GAMP diagram not dealing well with product life cycles. Your development plan needs to account for the validation software life cycle. In addition, there has to be provision for the following items. Change control. Listings of all changes made, why, and what the ramifications are. Bug and issue tracking. This is done during the formal testing phase as well as after the system has been put into service. Documentation practices, what documents exist, who is responsible for them, their location and organization. Security, what provisions are made to avoid unauthorized access to the programming. This is in part a matter of controlling the stability of the software and the company's intellectual property. Vendor audit reports, why were the vendors you worked with chosen, and why and who 
were not. As you might expect, the cost of developing validated systems can be expensive because of the amount of work that goes into the process. The FDA is working with the industry using a technique called risk-based validation, which uses risk assessment as a guide to implementing validation efforts, reducing costs, and achieving acceptable results. A risk-based approach to validation requires that the system be studied and that the risk for failure of each component of the system be determined. The bullets on the screen will give you an idea of the kind of things you need to look at. Prior to the evaluation, a document needs to be prepared that describes how the risks are to be determined, how they are going to be ranked in terms of severity, and how they are going to be addressed. This chart is one example of a risk matrix that might be designed to support a risk-based validation program. It looks at the likelihood of a problem and then the consequences for that problem, in this case in terms of human injury. Note, in laboratory work you might look at the potential for causing indirect data or other criteria instead of human injury. In this case, areas where there is a high likelihood of occurrence and a high likelihood of serious injury will get the most scrutiny. Areas where there is no human injury and very low likelihood that the problem will manifest itself will receive little attention. As you might imagine, this allows some problems to slip through which might, in unforeseen circumstances, cause serious problems. So validation is not a one-time operation, but needs to be continuously reviewed to make sure that the assumptions that were used to design the program are still supportable. Another variation on risk-based validation programs is shown in this chart. GAMP, or Good Automated Manufacturing Practices, is a system of regulations that can be applied to both manufacturing and laboratory applications. The 5 refers to the fact that it's in its fifth version. This chart looks at classes of systems, in this case computer and instruments, and determines the level of validation action that has to be taken based on each class. In the simplest case, class 1, we are looking at operating systems, and the action the user needs to take is to record the version of the operating system and make sure it's suitable for the products that are layered on top of it. As you move through the classes, you can see that the work entailed increases depending upon the amount of customization and customer-specific attributes that are in place. In Class 5, where we are looking at custom software, the full suite of vendor audits and project management validation activities are required. So far, we've looked at how project management differs from more common applications of the methodology, why it is important to have an effective program to manage lab systems development, how it applies to lab automation processes, and the analysis of processes and the procedures under consideration for project work, the potential effects of products in different stages of the life cycles, and the concept of validation, which is essential components of delivering a completed, successful project. An understanding of these points is needed if you're going to apply project management techniques to scientific work in any discipline or industry. In the next section, we'll be looking at considerations for systems integration, standards, the major elements of a project, scheduling and cost issues, outsourcing, and project management methodologies.